So good morning. Thank you guys all uh, for being here. We're excited for this session today on behalf of uh, Katie McAndrews over here, uh, who is my co-chair for this. Uh, Katie's from Rush University. I'm John Kogan from Seattle Children's Hospital. We're excited to do the uh, session today. So a few pointers. We think the ARS will work, the audience response system. So as you see, there are no microphones in the room. So first things first, if you guys hopefully have your phones and the app downloaded, just kind of navigate to our session and just ask questions whenever as the presenters are talking. Each presenter is going to have about 15 minutes to talk, and then we'll have several minutes after uh, for questions. We're going to monitor the questions up here. If something, if we ask one of your questions and you want to follow up or something, and you're brave enough to just stand up and yell it out, that is fine with us. Uh, we, you know, we like to be kind of informal. And then we'll just repeat the question, so hopefully everybody will get a chance to hear. Uh, neither Katie or I really have any uh, disclosures. So this is the uh, learning objectives for the session. We're going to hopefully have you all learn uh, or describe how the decision to diagnose and treat a pulmonary exacerbation has changed in this current highly effective modulator era. Summarize how HEMT impacts the presence of CF-related microorganisms, and then recognize how pulmonary exacerbation events have changed since the introduction of the modulators. This is the workshop outline, so we're just doing the intro right now. The times are super weird because it's a 15-minute talk and eight, eight, technically eight minutes for questions and answers. We'll do our best to stay on time, obviously, to give each presenter an opportunity um, to present their work. Um, and these are all the talks. We're excited. We're having people kind of come from all over the U.S. as well as some international um, speakers as well. So I think with that, we'll just go ahead and get started. So I first want to invite up Dr. Samini Srinivasan. Dr. Srinivasan is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and the University of Tennessee College of Medicine and the director of the CF Center at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital. And Dr. Srinivasan is going to talk about respiratory outcomes in the era of high-quality modulator therapies, results from the Tennessee and Mississippi CF Consortium. So welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back in person here at NACFC 2022. First and foremost, I would like to thank the program chairs for inviting me to do this talk. And today, my slides not advanced. All right, thank you. Today, I will be discussing results on respiratory outcomes in the era of high-quality modulator therapy talking about the results from the Tennessee and Mississippi Cystic Fibrosis Consortium. I have no disclosures for this presentation. So cystic fibrosis, as we all know, is an autosomal recessive disease, and it results from mutations in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene that codes for the CFTR protein. Therapies have traditionally focused on limiting end organ damage until the availability of modulators, starting with IVACAPTOR, that target the underlying disease mechanism. So a couple of years ago, we have had the approval of triple combination modulator therapy. So the combination of Alexa-CAPTOR, IVACAPTOR, and TASA-CAPTOR, when administered to patients who were homozygous for the phenylalanine 508 deletion mutation, was found to have significantly improved pulmonary function better respiratory quality of life scores, as well as lower sweat chloride. And this was when compared to dual combination therapy with tazacaptor and ivacaptor. When this medication was now tried in patients who had one copy of the phenylalanine 508 deletion mutation, there was a 14% improvement in FEV1, fewer pulmonary exacerbations, and decreased sweat chloride, but this was compared to placebo. So this medication is now FDA approved for patients ages um, six and up. And as we can see here from the data, CF Foundation data, patient data registry from 2021, a high percentage of patients who are modulator eligible are actually on modulator therapy. At this point, I would like to switch gears and talk about our consortium. So the pediatric center directors from the state of Tennessee met at NACFC 2019, which coincidentally was held in Nashville, Tennessee. And at that time, the idea of forming a statewide consortium was broached. And with the pandemic, of course, we could not meet in person. So we started having virtual meetings starting in June of 2020. 
Later in the year, our membership was extended to the adult CF centers, and the University of Mississippi adult and pediatric programs joined us in August 2021. We continue to have meetings held every month, and meeting minutes are circulated after each meeting. So the consortium had two posters at NACFC 2021. We have had a statewide virtual CF team retreat in May 2021. So during our monthly meetings, members often talked about how we are seeing fewer CF hospitalizations, how pulmonary function seems to be better, and we all also observed that fewer cultures that we were getting were from sputum, rather, from sputum and more were from oropharyngeal swabs. So based on this, we decided to look at respiratory outcomes formally in, the, in our patients. So we decided to analyze data on pediatric and adult CF patients followed at participating centers and who had a signed CFF registry consent. So data collection was all from the CF patient registry as this was IRB approved at each participating institution. So parameters to be analyzed were agreed upon by the group and included pulmonary function in the form of FEV1% predicted, respiratory culture sources, whether sputum or oropharyngeal swabs, and the number of hospitalizations. As far as sputum microbiology was concerned, we decided to focus on the prevalence of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Bacolria cepatia, and non-tuberculous mycobacteria. To be included in the analysis, patients had to have mutations that were ETI eligible. Patients ages 6 to 11 were included if they started this medication by July 2021. And we were going to collect data for the year prior and the year after starting ETI. So data collection was done by registry coordinators at each center. The whole group agreed upon the formation of the spreadsheets on which this data was collected. So data recorded prior to starting ETI was labeled pre, and the data post was labeled post. So individual center sheets were then sent to the pediatric center director in Memphis, Tennessee, and a final data sheet was generated by collating all the individual ones and sent for statistical analysis. So we used the SAS version 9.4 software to perform statistical analysis using a student t-test to compare FEV1 percentage predicted and the number of hospitalizations prior to and after ETI. We used a chi-square goodness of fit test to compare culture sources as being sputum or oropharyngeal, as well as the prevalence of the different microorganisms. We then used a Kruskal Wallace test to look for any correlation between low lung function and the culture source. So our final data set has analysis from 510 patients followed in these two states. As we see here, FEV1 percentage predicted improved significantly post ETI. And following ETI, fewer patients were able to expectorate sputum for a respiratory culture, and there were fewer hospitalizations. And as we can see, all of these p-values are very significant. Looking at sputum microbiology, there were fewer isolations of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, fewer isolations of both methicillin-resistant and methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus, Bacolria cepatia, and NTM. Although for non-tuberculous mycobacteria, this value just reached statistical significance at a P of 0 0.044. We then decided to analyze the pediatric data set separately, and of the 219 pediatric patients, again we see there is a significant improvement in FEV1% predicted, fewer patients were able to expectorate sputum, and there were fewer hospitalizations. Now, if there are, the numbers don't, may not add up sometimes, that is because we, have, we do have some missing data. Looking at sputum microbiology in the pediatric population, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa was significantly less prevalent post-ETI than it was prior to therapy, as was methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. However, there was no significant change in the presence of methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus Bacolria cepatia, and non-tuberculous mycobacteria. 
Of note, though, with the last two organisms, there was only one positive result in pre-therapy and none post-therapy. Looking at the 291 adult patients in, this, in the data set, again, FEV1 percentage predicted was significantly improved. Adults, as for children, were able to expectorate sputum less frequently for a respiratory culture, and adults were also hospitalized less often post-ETI. Looking at the adult sputum microbiology, again, the prevalence of pseudomonas was decreased, as was MRSA and MSSA, as well as non-tuberculous mycobacteria, but not Burkholderia cepatia. So it was interesting that the adults had lesser isolation of MSSA, but not children. So looking at more respiratory cultures from oropharyngeal swabs rather than sputums, we then decided to look at whether or not this was due to better lung function and what if the patients had low lung functions. So what we then did was look at patients who had an FEV1 percentage predicted less than 60%, and this is one year post ETI. And what we find here again is that much more of the cultures were much, rather the cultures were much more likely to be from an oropharyngeal swab than they were to be from sputum. So off note, for the entire data set, there were a lot of missing data, and as same for the adult patients. So adult patients with an FEV1 percentage predicted were more likely to have a, spu uh, a respiratory culture from oropharyngeal swab than sputum, but not so on the pediatric side. So with this finding, we said, is it that we have to look at even lower lung function? So we did this analysis again, looking at lung functions with an FEV1 percentage predicted less than 50. And here what we see is, sorry. So looking at all the patients, again, there were missing data. Now we see that cultures were as likely to be from sputum as they were from an oropharyngeal swab for the entire data set and for the adult data set, both of which had missing data. On the pediatric side, again, this was equally likely to be sputum as it was an oropharyngeal swab. But of note, in the pediatric subset, there were only seven patients. So overall, what we saw was improved outcomes in pulmonary outcomes in patients followed at nine CF centers across the states of Tennessee and Mississippi following ETI therapy for at least one year. FEV1 percentage predicted was significantly approved, well, improved sorry, for the overall data set and for the pediatric and adult patients. Patients had fewer hospitalizations and fewer patients were able to expectorate a sputum sample for culture overall and even at an FEV1 percentage predicted less than 60%. So fewer respiratory cultures were positive for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, methicillin-sensitive and methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Burkholderia cepatia, and non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And as I mentioned earlier, decreased isolation of MSSA from adult, but not pediatric patients. NTM isolation was also decreased in adults, but not pediatric patients. And this is likely reflective of fewer positive cultures pre-therapy in the pediatric group. Now, when clinical trials with this medication were done, one of the inclusion criteria was that FEV1 percentage predicted between 40 and 90. So our data set did not exclude any of the patients. So we do have some patients who had very low FEV1 percent predicted. We recognize our study has limitations. So ETI approval came about in November of 2019, which means a number of our patients were starting this therapy just as COVID-19 precautions were being, implement, being implemented. Another thing was with the shelter-in-place precautions, there was social isolation, potentially fewer exposures to respiratory viral infections, and which could have led to fewer hospitalizations. So there were fewer clinic visits dur during this period. There was a lack of data for some patients for pulmonary function and respiratory culture results, 
so which means they could not be included in the analysis. So with that, I would like to share our references and particularly to acknowledge the registry coordinators at each and every one of the nine participating centers. And now we will take questions and thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent talk. So um, feel free again just to remind you guys that you can go into the app um, and then under there you should see a Q&A tab if you go to our session and feel free to just type away. All right, we have a question. Um, positive cultures, for example, for uh, pseudomonas have gone down in absolute numbers, but this may be due to the overall lower number of collected sputum samples. So are they really less prevalent, or do you catch them less often? Have you so, compared percentages of the collected samples that are positive for each pathogen? Okay, so question. to clarify, it's a great question. And um, full disclosure, um, putting this whole thing together, there were no patient identifiers. So what we did was we included patients if they had data for the pre and post period. So the only way to definitively say if the patient had pseudomonas or not would be by a bronchoscopy. And we discussed that several times in our meetings, but the question was when patients were doing so well, how do we justify that? So to see, is it really decreased? You know, I think we would need a bronchoscopy to prove that. Can I ask you a follow-up question to that? So, you know, the the goals of the session were really to think about exacerbations, defining them, treating them, and I'm curious what your thoughts are about those rates going down, but then also what would you do, I guess, if one of these people showed up for exacerbation treatment? So if they've had pseudomonas before, let's say pre-modulator, then you get a culture a year later and it's now no longer there. Based on what you just said, but also just with your clinical experience, would mm -hmm. you still cover for pseudomonas or would you just target whatever was seen on the most recent culture? So interestingly enough, we have, again, with our monthly meetings, we have discussed this several times, and the consensus has been if they have had pseudomonas, we have tended to treat them. You know, unless somebody had a bronchoscopy and we could prove, okay, they truly do not have it. We have another question. Um, did your team have an explanation why MSSA was decreased in adults but not in the pediatric population? Again, we do not know that. All we know is these were the numbers. These were the number that were positive prior to and afterwards in the pediatric and the adult data set. So we, we, we thought about that. And the only thing I can think of is MSSA is an organism that tends to be common in the younger age groups. And we see it less prevalent as patients age. So that's the only thing I could think of. Ask, can I ask you another one? I'm curious about, Absolutely. and maybe you don't, you don't know this from your data set, but I guess just from your experience working with the investigators, both in Tennessee and Mississippi, do you guys see adherence differences you know, within the state, between the states, um, with respect to the modulators? So, you know, with respect to the modulators, you know, ETI has been such a game changer that this has been less of an issue because we have patients now who feel so good and actually a lot of my co-investigators, actually all of them are here. And if anybody wants to speak up, feel free to do so. But overall with ETI, it has been really good. You know, seldom have we come across, you know, Vertex calling us saying so-and-so is not filling their prescription. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so our next speaker will be Dr. Alexandra Toporek. Dr. Toporek is a third year pulmonary and critical care fellow at Johns Hopkins University and she works in clinical CF and lung transplant research and additionally completed a master's of health sciences at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome. <laughs> 
Um, so, <clears throat> as Dr. Kogan mentioned, my name is Alex Tepormik. I'm a third year adult pulmonary critical care fellow. Um, and today I'll be discussing provider practices in the management of pulmonary exacerbations in the era of highly effective modulator therapy. Okay, I have no disclosures. Um, so briefly, my objectives today are to review current definitions and clinical guidelines for exacerbation management, uh, to briefly introduce our research question and study design as well as uh, discuss our results and delve a little bit into future directions. Um, so as we're all aware, there is no consensus diagnosis for a pulmonary exacerbation. Uh, the most commonly used definition in exacerbation research is an increase in symptoms and or reduction in lung function plus a clinical decision to treat with antibiotics. Um, but there are a number of limitations with this diagnosis, namely that a clinician decision-based definition is not standardized uh, given the wide variability in clinical practice. Um, so the pathophysiology of an exacerbation involves a very complex interplay between the host immune response and bacteria in airways. And contributing factors include viral pathogens, uh, the acquisition of new bacterial strains, clonal expansion of existing bacterial strains, uh, as well as airway inflammation. And a major developing question in the era of highly effective modulator therapy is are these factors different in patients who are on HEMT? Um, so these are the clinical care guidelines that were published in 2013 for maintenance therapy management. I mean, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but you can see highlighted by the blue box here that there's a reasonable amount of data to support these practices. Um, however, even with that, uh, I think the question that I asked myself when starting this project is do these guidelines accurately reflect what clinicians and patients are doing now with their maintenance therapies? I mean, anecdotally, I think a lot of us can attest that the answer to this is no. And these are the clinical care guidelines established in 2009 for the management of exacerbations. Uh, and again, looking at this uh, blue box, um, we can see the prevailing theme here is that there's really not much evidence to guide clinicians on how to manage exacerbations uh, even before the era of highly effective modular therapy. Um, so if patients and providers have drastically changed their practices with regards to uh, evidence-based maintenance therapies, uh, it was quite possible that the management of exacerbations uh, which had limited practice supporting data uh, to begin with may have also changed. Um, so our, we sought to determine whether or not there are differences in uh, exacerbation diagnosis and management in the era of HEMT compared to prior to the approval of Alex Teziva, uh, and if so, what drives these differences? So we conducted 19 semi-structured qualitative interviews uh, amongst, uh, over Zoom amongst clinicians, including physicians as well as advanced practice providers um, at CF centers nationally from the winter of 2021 until the summer of 2022. Uh, interviews were conducted over Zoom and they were digitally recorded and professionally transcribed. Uh, and we used inductive coding uh, to perform a thematic analysis to identify recurring themes and sub-themes using in vivo software. Um, thematic saturation was assessed throughout the entirety of the coding process, uh, and two researchers independently coded a, a representative sample of interviews uh, and made COBA revisions throughout the process to achieve a kappa coefficient uh, greater than 0 0.7. Um, so this is the demographic data for our respondents. Um, and as you can see here, um, the, one, the, the one differential that's quite notable is that uh, our population was skewed towards physicians as opposed to uh, advanced practice providers. Um, so to address this differential, we assess thematic saturation within each of these populations of providers and uh, achieve thematic saturation within each group as well as within uh, clinicians overall. I mean, I think not included on this table, we interviewed providers from a variety of geographic regions as well. Um, so this diagram is a general overview of each of the themes that we identified. And I'll be reviewing the themes and sub-themes with exemplar quotes throughout the remainder of my discussion. Um, but the two themes outlining factors that influence the management of uh, exacerbation diagnosis and management um, were that exacerbations have changed in the era of HAMT and that providers are less anxious about exacerbation outcomes. And we identified three themes describing differences in exacerbation diagnosis and management. Uh, and they were that providers are redefining exacerbations in the era of HEMT, that patients are driving their care more than they did in the pre-HEMT era, and that provider management is less aggressive than in the HEMT era. Um, so looking into factors that influence management ex exacerbations, our first theme that exacerbations have changed in the era of HEMT. Um, as I'm sure a lot of us can attest, uh, exacerbations are milder than they were before. 
Uh, the respiratory symptoms like sputum production, cough, dyspnea are there, but they're less. Um, and as this quote highlights, people are still feeling better than before Trikapta, even during moderate exacerbations. Um, and then uh, many respondents also indicated that in addition to exacerbations being mild divergence of pre-HEMT exacerbations, some have a different symptom profile entirely. Um, so providers emphasize that systemic complaints like fatigue and appetite changes with or without overt respiratory symptoms were the primary presenting complaints of exacerbations. Uh, and if respiratory claims, complaints are present, they're uh, often more vague, like chest tightness, but without the wheezing, productive cough, and dyspnea that we're used to seeing in association with exacerbations. And because of these changes, providers are questioning diagnosis and management. Um, I think when thinking about the pathophysiology of an exacerbation, they're asking themselves, uh, are these mild symptoms how the same damaging pathology presents in patients on HEMT because lung function is so much better? Uh, namely, providers are wondering if they should treat these sort of mild, nonspecific symptoms as they would a mild exacerbation in the pre-HEMT era with oral antibiotics. And considering management decisions a bit further, uh, a recurring sub-theme that we identified was related to culture data. Um, so as very well described in our last presentation, patients on HEMT are oftentimes not producing enough uh, sputum for monitoring sputum cultures at quarterly clinic visits. Um, so throat cultures are becoming more commonplace, but what are clinicians doing with throat cultures? Um, as we can see uh, from these quotes, we received extremely variable responses from providers regarding how much they trust uh, oropharyngeal culture data, um, with some saying that throat cultures seemed equivalent to sputum, uh, and others saying that throat cultures seemed very insensitive when assessing uh, lower respiratory tract uh, infectious burden. And then what about sputum cultures? How are providers obtaining and using sputum culture data uh, to inform their clinical decisions? Um, so for providers who were skeptical about the sensitivity of throat cultures, many have indications or set time periods in their mind uh, during which they'll pursue a sputum culture over a throat culture. Um, one provider describes using annual induced sputum for surveillance and another pursuing sputum specifically with uh, clinical changes or imaging changes. And then our second theme is that providers are less anxious about exacerbations. Um, providers explain that they expect exacerbations to progress less rapidly, uh, and for the most part, they expect their patients to return to their pre-exacerbation baseline. Um, and this reduced anxiety impacts the time frame in which they start antibiotic therapy for milder exacerbations, um, which we'll discuss a little bit more momentarily. Now delving uh, into changes in the diagnosis and management, we have our third theme that providers are redefining exacerbations in the era of HEMT. Um, so a number of providers explain that they've developed alternate ways of assessing exacerbation in light of the, all the changes that they've seen in exacerbation presentation. Um, many providers are asking patients about extra pulmonary and systemic symptoms, describing that assessing for exacerbations in patients who are on HEMT uh, requires a very detail-oriented approach. And then similarly to the management of maintenance therapies, another theme that we identified is that patients are driving their care more than in the pre-HEMT era. And providers explain that patients are managing mild exacerbations on their own. So a patient will come into clinic, uh, they'll say a few weeks or a few months ago, I had some symptoms that were maybe consistent with an exacerbation, uh, but I restarted my, the maintenance therapies that they had discontinued and they sort of got over the symptoms on their own and they, they never contacted the CF care team to you know, discuss their symptoms or the management plan. And how is this different than in the pre-HEMT era? Um, a lot of providers told us that previously their practice was to establish a sick plan with their patients, uh, where symptomatic patients will call their CF care team, inform them of their symptoms, they'll escalate their maintenance therapies for two or three days, and then afterwards will present to clinic uh, in person for an evaluation to, if their symptoms are persisting or they're worsened, to consider antibiotics. Um, so what's different now? I, uh, providers explain that we are restarting previously discontinued therapies before jumping to orals uh, since ETI, uh, whereas previously we were instructing patients to increase maintenance therapies that they had already been on for a brief period of time before initiating orals. Um, I think said more simply by this quote here is that we were quicker to jump to orals pre-HEMT. Um, additionally, patients who don't report exacerbations to providers in the HEMT era are no longer being evaluated by a provider uh, following exacerbation treatment. 
And could this be a problem? Uh, some providers indicated that this practice results in lots of waiting for patients who maybe needed to be evaluated sooner. And providers explained how they felt about uh, patients managing mild exacerbations on their own very much depended on the patient. Um, because it takes an accountable patient to execute these treatments in a timely fashion, um, and then a communicative patient who will promptly inform their care team uh, if, if their symptoms don't improve. And then our last theme that we explored is that provider management is less aggressive in the era of HEMT. Uh, so providers explain that changes in exacerbation management reflect decreased exacerbation severity uh, rather than a true change in approach to exacerbation management. Uh, so consistent with pre-HEMT era practices, exacerbation is ultimately based on exacerbation, management is ultimately based on exacerbation severity. Um, and it just so happens that in the era of HEMT, exacerbations are less severe. And then providers also said that they were waiting longer to start antibiotics. Uh, many explained that this, this is largely because the overall course of exacerbations is milder and less rapidly progressive um, than previously, and that patients' lung disease is much improved since starting triple therapy. Um, and furthermore, they're finding that patients are returning to their baseline uh, with restarting discontinued maintenance therapies alone, um, and they're able to, as this last quote says, get away without antibiotics. And then lastly, providers explain that they tend to prescribe shorter durations of antibiotics for the treatment of exacerbations. Uh, many alluded to results from the STOP trial that, that investigating uh, the optimal duration of antibiotic therapy for exacerbations as prompting this change. Um, but a lot had a very challenging time separating the impact of the, these, these trial results and triple therapy, um, as generally patients who are on HEMT tend to return to their uh, pre-exacerbation baseline much more quickly um, after the initiating exacerbation treatment. Um, so again, here's our conceptual framework uh, filled out a little bit more to include the subthemes that I mentioned. Um, briefly to review, so the two factors we identified that influence the diagnosis and management of exacerbations were changes in the presentation of exacerbations and that providers are less anxious about exacerbation outcomes. Um, and the three themes that described differences in exacerbation diagnosis and management um, were that uh, providers were redefining exacerbations, uh, patients were driving their care more in exacerbation management, um, and that provider management is less aggressive in the era of HEMT. Um, so in summary, uh, our results suggest that exacerbations have evolved to become a more subtle pathology that's often managed less aggressively, sometimes without antibiotics or by the patient without a provider's evaluation. Um, while prior research in the pre-HEMT era may suggest a benefit to more aggressive therapies like IV antibiotics or hospitalization, providers are still feeling less anxious about exacerbations on HEMT despite less aggressive management because patients are healthier and exacerbations are less severe. Um, so considering future directions, I think in the coming years, we'll have to focus on revised clinical criteria for exacerbations in patients on HEMT, preferably a non-clinician-based decision because um, a non-clinician-based definition as a lot, of, a lot of times providers are no longer managing exacerbations, it's the patients. Um, and we'll also need some information regarding whether or not clinical outcomes for mild or exacerbations are similar in patients who are treated with oral antibiotics and those who are treated just by restarting discontinued therapies. Um, and then we'll also need, as we discussed in the, in the last presentation, um, to assess the sensitivity of throat cultures in investigating sort of lower respiratory infectious burden in patients on HEMT. Um, so a uh, big thank you to my mentorship team, Natalie West and Kristen Reichert. Uh, as well as Christian Marlowe, and our research coordinator, Shivani, and then uh, most of all to all of the respondents who volunteered their time uh, to participate in this study. So we have some questions for you. Great. Um, uh, the first question is, should we screen more carefully for fatigue as a marker of a pulmonary exacerbation? Yeah, I think I had very mixed results in my interviews about this. I would say half of the respondents that I spoke with um, mentioned that oftentimes the only presenting complaint for a mild exacerbation will be profound fatigue. Um, but I, I think one interviewee had a very uh, thoughtful response to this. They, they mentioned that sometimes if you really push these patients further to ask them about potential respiratory symptoms, some of them will say, you know, if I walk so far, maybe I get a little bit more short of breath. Um, so fatigue certainly as one complaint, but assessing in addition, you know, broadly for 
any inkling of, of a change from their, of their respiratory status from baseline, uh, in addition to other systemic complaints like, like appetite changes, um, might be a, a good approach moving forward. Yeah, so, uh, so the question was, uh, are we using home spirometry at all to, um, to sort of investigate whether or not someone's having an exacerbation? I think we've had variable success with that in our, in our patient population, um, personally at our center. Uh, more broadly, the respondents that I spoke with uh, occasionally mentioned home spirometry, but I think it sort of depends on the patient and whether or not they, they've you know, taken it out of the box or uh, they're using it regularly. Um, but I, I do think some providers did mention that that is sort of a helpful metric for them, especially when looking at those milder exacerbations and they're not really wanting to bring people into clinic. Um, home spirometry could certainly be helpful. We have another question. If patients are waiting to call us with an exacerbation and trying to treat it on their own first, should we really be waiting longer to pre prescribe antibiotics when we hear about the exacerbation? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question, and I, I definitely think that's something that's going to need more uh, investigation moving forward. Um, I have the same question in my head. Um, and I think the, the real question is, are exacerbations truly different on triple therapy than they were previously? Um, because if they are just a, a much more mild thing that can improve with airway clearance, uh, perhaps we don't need to treat with orals as often as we do. Um, but I think that is something that will need a lot more uh, studying moving forward to, to provide a really adequate answer for that. Sorry, just as a quick plug for that, uh, if anybody's interested in that, the stop heeds data is being presented currently and there's a poster um, as well about it. So I don't want to give it away, but it's intriguing data, I'll just say. <laughs> All right, one more question. Are any centers or is the CF Foundation working on developing guidelines on how frequently patients should undergo sputum induction or bronchoscopy while on HEMT for pathogen detection? I think that's a great question that I do not know the answer to. Um, I think the question, you know, I, I had one respondent who said that to her, throat cultures or oropharyngeal cultures were meaningless and that the only thing that she would really trust that someone had completely cleared a pathogen from their lower respiratory tract was a bronch. Um, but as we discussed in the, in the last presentation, I think um, you know, performing a bronchoscopy in a patient who's otherwise doing quite well uh, you know, seems like an unnecessary practice. Um, I'm not sure if there are new guidelines that are, are being developed, but I think we'll need more information regarding um, you know, how sensitive are throat cultures. I'm sure that probably, are, the improvement that we're seeing on throat cultures is likely a reflection of more well-controlled upper airway disease. Uh, so I think we'll just need investigation into what factors might contribute to a throat culture being less sensitive in certain patients than others. Um, but I, I don't think uh, we have quite enough data to necessarily make helpful, strongly evidence-based uh, guidelines on that. One more question. Is there any correlative data regarding pulmonary exacerbation frequency and severity and, severity and provider subjective observations? Um, I am not 100% sure about the answer to that question. I think there has been, uh, well, I mean, there was really no agreed upon um, way to evaluate for severity of an exacerbation. So one could argue that, you know, De defining exacerbation severity on itself is sort of a clinical impression and, and based on a provider's subjective opinion. Um, if we move beyond, you know, severe exacerbations are treated with IV antibiotics and milds are treated with orals. Um, so, but I don't think that there's been anything like that in the post, uh, the post trikafta era that I'm aware of. Can I ask one more question? Have you thought about doing the same study but with patients and uh, parents? to see how they feel about it? Uh, yeah, I think I've, I've thought about that before. We haven't, we haven't really pursued that too much. I think we, uh, most of our efforts in talking to patients and families has been centered around uh, maintenance therapies and kind of what they're doing with that in the era of Trikafta. Uh, but I think that's a, it's a great thought and an important thing to look into with exacerbations as well. Our next speaker um, has just arrived from Denmark, um, uh, Dr. Jeppensen, who's a senior physician at our house, uh, University Hospital. She's going to be talking about change in pulmonary infections 12 months after alexacafic 
Kafter, she's a Kafter, I have a Kafter introduction. Results from the Danish National Cystic Fibrosis Cohort. So let's get you started here. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Maybrit Jeppesen. I come from the Aarhus Cystic Fibrosis Center in Denmark. Um, I work as a senior consultant with uh, adult patients with cystic fibrosis. Thank uh, you. Um, yes. Thank you. <coughs> My research interests are pulmonary infection, uh, kidney function, and renal uh, urinary excretion, and uh, pregnancy and CF. Um, thank you for inviting me for this session today. I'll be foc focusing on pulmonary infection before and after EGI therapy in the Danish uh, National Cystic Fibrosis Cohort. These are my disclosures. This is an overview of the uh, CFTR modulator introduction in Denmark. In September 2022, we had full access of uh, triple combination therapy for uh, patients with CF above 12 years of age uh, and uh, with an DLF5 08 uh, mutation. So we uh, initiated studies of pulmonary infection before and after ETI therapy in, in a nationwide observational cohort study with data from the Danish Cystic Fibrosis Registry covering uh, both centers in Copenhagen and Aarhus um, University Hospitals in Denmark. Uh, this Danish Cystic Fibrosis Registry contains both clinical microbiology and biochemistry data. Um, and uh, are gathered when people, uh, uh, patients with CF uh, come to the CF clinic in the two centers. We have a follow-up uh, on patients' uh, level from five years before and in years after ETI initiation in this uh, project I'm presenting today. And I will be presenting uh, initial 12 months follow-up data um, from this uh, cohort study. We included patients from the National Danish Cystic Fibrosis Cohort, uh, patients uh, with uh, a minimum of one year of ETI therapy in the study period, uh, which means patient completed uh, one year of follow-up uh, with an age above 12 years. We exclu excluded uh, lung transplant patients and uh, a couple of patients who had no sputum samples in the study period. And that uh, ended up in a total of 283 patients uh, in our study cohort, uh, comprising around 90% of patients elect eligible for uh, ETI therapy in Denmark. <coughs> patients in Denmark attend the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic every four to eight weeks in average. ETI therapy is uh, distributed directly to the patients in the clinics and not through the pharmacies. So we have a very uh, precise um, information about adherence uh, to treatment and uh, about uh, uh, causes of uh, rare discontinuation of therapy. We collect data for clinical and research purposes um, and we do expectorates or if, not, if that's not possible, we do nasopharyngeal aspirates for specialized, specialized cultures. Uh, apart from that, we do spirometry and uh, other clinical assessments together with a biobanking of uh, sputum and blood samples. And we, do, um, red, uh, red, we gather data on antibiotic usage and plants. <coughs> These are the patient characteristics at ETI initiation at the, in this cohort of uh, 283 patients. Uh, we have around 52 uh, female patients with a median age of 26 years. 
the mean. Sweat chloride um, is uh, 94 at ETI initiation, reflecting that we have a um, rather severe uh, genetic uh, composition of patient in our cohort. Uh, despite of that, uh, they have quite a well-reserved lung function with a median percent predicted FEV1 uh, on 77%. Uh, Around 25% uh, of our patients have CF-related diabetes, and the mean BMI is 21. 74% <clears throat> of the patients are del uh, 508 homozygous. And um, this is an overview of the pre-ETI uh, modulator therapy, where you can see that Around 30% of our patients were uh, modulator therapy naive when they started treatment. <clears throat> this is an overview of the sample types that we do in the clinic. We don't do oral swaps, but we are very active with the nasopharyngeal section. Again, this is patients uh, above 12 years of age. These are uh, the development in sample types from the clinic uh, five years prior to and one year after ETI therapy. Um, these patients, 20, uh, 283 patients, have together uh, over 15,000 airway sputum samples. So we do a lot of cultures. As you can see, um, there's uh, a little change. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to interpret because uh, it's the corona pandemic, yes, just prior to the ETI therapy initiation. But in Denmark, we initiated ETI therapy uh, in the same uh, year as we um, saw the co uh, corona uh, virus pandemic. And because the patient are uh, coming to the clinic and getting the medication directly in the clinic, we had uh, um, an opportunity to, to see them anyway. So um, we, did, we don't have a lot of missing data due to the pandemic. <clears throat> These are the uh, overall uh, numbers of sputum samples where you can see that uh, in average uh, there's around 20 sputum samples per patient with a slight non-significant uh, decreasing tendency. Um, <clears throat> these are um, the culture results during the years um, where uh, we have um, cultured patients and uh, divided the pathogens into significant uh, pathogens and non-significant pathogens. So the positive culture samples are samples with a significant pathogen, uh, excluding uh, normal flora, skin flora, uh, and uh, candida. And as you can see, there's a marked decline in culture positivity in the different age groups when you look at the overall um, culture positivity and this is on the this is on sample level so this is um, the pro proportion of culture culture positive uh, tests uh, as you can see um, there's a, a smaller amount of the patient with in the uh, younger age group um, with uh, culture po positive samples, but there's a, a decline in, in all the age groups, even in the older patients with severe lung disease and uh, a lot of positive cultures pre-ETI. <coughs> this is an overview of the pathogen-specific uh, cultures. As you can see, uh, we have uh, a little over 50 thousand samples during the study period. These are the specific pathogens 
Uh, and again, this is on a sample level, which means that um, we're comparing the um, percentage of positive cultures during the years of EGI therapy. And it's very obvious that there's a large decrease in culture-positive culture samples. Of course, this is um, uh, consistent with uh, what we experience in the clinical practice. And this is uh, combined data for both um, expectorates and nasopharyngeal suctions. This is data on patient level. We have looked into proportion of uh, patients in the different culture groups, which means that we have uh, looked into the percentage of uh, positive cultures that the patients have in the follow-up year for the specific pathogen. So <clears throat> we can see that um, the proportion of patients with no Pseudomonas cultures at all it goes significantly up in the year after EGI therapy initiation. And um, it's the same tend tendency, but not uh, significant for Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, I would like to add that we don't have uh, the MRSA um, in Denmark as much, so this is uh, most, this is MSSA we're talking about. The same for mold, where you can see there's a marked decline uh, in the, the findings, and uh, we can see that um, patients with no growth of mold um, increases significantly. So it was very interesting to hear the other talks. Um, um, I think that um, these uh, decreases in pulmonary um, positive cultures, together with decrease in pulmonary symptoms and antibiotic usage, together with uh, an increase in, in pulmonary function and functional levels and, and expected increase in pregnancy should be considered when we plan a patient therapy and antibiotic therapy in the future. This is the um, CFQR respiratory domain and um, um, the different scores. And of course, um, uh, this, uh, and the, oh, so, sorry, this is the laboratory detected um, cases of influenza and RS virus in Denmark. And um, it's just to uh, show you that we have um, a situation where we need to interpret these uh, data in an era of both a coronavirus pandemic, but also in the years after with a very atypical virus uh, season. So that means that uh, we have to take that into consideration when we interpret culture results and uh, pulmonary exacerbation rates. <clears throat> this is a little corner of one of my patients. Uh, and I think that's a very typical problem. She has had EGI for 12 months and has improved very much clinically. But she belongs to the group of patients with persisting PA. And of course, uh, she's much more than uh, this corner. She wants to uh, do an education and go through the, with pregnancies. And uh, of course, our perspective is to preserve lung function. So we have to be aware that there's a large uh, proportion of patients which are still culture positive uh, with uh, severe bronchiectasy disease, uh, but also uh, decreasing adherence to antibiotic regimens. And we have to consider long-term antibiotic adverse effects in order to preserve kidney function and uh, avoid um, uh, antibiotic resistance development for these patients uh, 
I very much uh, agree in the observations from the previous study. I experienced the same uh, tendency where um, patients uh, tend to manage their pulmonary exacerbations and they don't uh, ask for cultures unless they have coughed for two weeks. So um, we look into an era with where we need to consider change of culture regimens and evidence-based individualized therapy regimens. Thank you. I have a question um, about your nasal pharyngeal aspir aspirates. How often do you do that? Do you do that four times a year? And how do patients mm -hmm. tolerate that? Uh, we made a, a national uh, consensus about trying to uh, keep uh, diagnostics and therapy pretty much unchanged in the first year of, of therapy. So um, we asked a patient to come as usual. So uh, in average, uh, it's um, six times uh, to eight times a year. And we do a culture every time they come to the clinic. So uh, if they can't do an expectorate, we do a nasopharyngeal suction instead. And do you see... Um a difference, a significant difference between the positivity between the, you know, expectorate versus the aspirate? Uh, I haven't looked into that yet, but I certainly will. And we have someone from the crowd, our audience. <laughs> um, you mentioned you, uh, you hand the uh, uh, ITE to patients in clinic, removing the need for them to obtain it from the pharmacy. Is there a reason for this? Is this a practice your center uh, does for all modulators? It's a, it's a common practice in Denmark for um, expensive medication, uh, very specialized and expensive medication are typically distributed in, in that way in, in the public health system. So it's, it's uh, the same. Um, and actually a question, um, why do you not have MRSA in Denmark? <laughs> Just <'cause. laughs> yeah. More careful yeah. than we are. Antibiotics, <laughs> probably. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, yeah. It's it's because of antibiotic uh, practices. We do have MRSA in in Denmark, but it's uh, sporadic cases, and uh, we have a quite um, successful eradication rate, and especially. Uh, after ETI therapy. Um, of course, um, we have a couple of patients where we question if they cleared this MRSA. Uh, we don't know because now we don't find it. So um, it has, uh, it, it, it's the same problem as with the other pathogens, but it's, it's very few patients in Denmark. I was really intrigued by your, um, your last slide. You were talking a little bit about these individualized therapy regimens and this concept of, I think of them as individualized antibiotic plants. And you know, this is successful in other conditions like bone marrow transplant, for example. And I've started to get more interested in this concept of you know, the healthier kids, adults, adolescents, maybe you can get the, you can wait longer, you can try orals first and airway clearance before IVs, but then maybe the sicker people, for whatever reason, lung function, Adherence issues, complicated organisms can sort of benefit from an individualized plan where you pick antibiotics that are maybe less uh, toxic, uh, particularly in someone like that, it looks like in your example, who has some antibiotic adverse effects. Is this something that you guys have started to do or just more thinking about in the future, these individualized therapy plans? Yes, uh, we, we have a very standardized uh, regimen where uh, patients do home IV treatment uh, with IV for 14 weeks and it's so integrated in the whole system so uh, we have to change that I guess uh, and uh, we're doing of course uh, more oral and inhalation therapy uh, and um, I think that um, uh, it will benefit the patients to do shorter uh, duration um, therapy um, 
a lot of other areas like endocarditis and bone infection tells us that this is uh, feasible and safe. So I think uh, we should consider that for CF as well, also from an antibiotic stewardship uh, point of view. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> All righty, next up we have Brian Sherwood, who's um, a PharmD. He's a clinical specialty pharmacy um, for Dartmouth Health, uh, specialty pharmacy in Lebanon, New Hampshire. He's originally from uh, Syracuse, New York, and attended the Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Albany. He graduated from there with both his doctorate in pharmacy and bachelor's in pharmaceutical sciences. And he went on to uh, complete a pharmacy residency uh, at, um, in the ambulatory care setting at Dartmouth Health. And it was during this res uh, residency that he rotated through their uh, New Hampshire CF Center and completed um, a medication use uh, evaluation titled Hospitalization Data in the era of highly effective uh, CFTR uh, modulator therapy. Um, he continues to work at Dartmouth, although currently right now um, his clinical interests include cystic fibrosis, diabetes, and in addition to dermatology. So, come on. Thank you everyone for coming to the presentation of hospitalization data in the era of highly effective CFTR modulator therapy. My name is Brian Sherwood. I'm a clinical specialty pharmacist from Dartmouth Health in New Hampshire. And in relation to this presentation, I have no disclosures. Uh, before diving in, I would like to uh, give a shout out and a thank you to the other member of my research team, uh, Emily Siemens, who's able to be in attendance today. And we'll hop into a brief overview. So for this study, uh, I'll start off with kind of the background as to why we wanted to perform this. Uh, some information about the institution it was uh, done in. The objectives of the study, as well as the methods and how we uh, found our results. We'll discuss the results, limitations, and then frame the limitations and the results into the conclusions. Starting with that background on CFTR modulators. Uh, CFTR modulators have been an effective treatment option for many people with cystic fibrosis. Uh, the current commercially available CFTR modulators can be classified as correctors or potentiators and are often used in combination therapies. However, even with these CFTR modulators that are available, not all CFTR gene mutations respond to currently available CFTR modulator treatment. So unfortunately, not all patients are able to be on these medications. So HEMT, or highly effective modulator therapy, the first widely available HEMT is considered to be the triple combination of Alexacaftor, Tazacaftor, and Ivacaftor. And I'll be referring to it as a widely available HEMT for the purposes of this presentation. This combination is considered widely available as it benefits a very large number of different CFTR mutations. And this combination builds upon previous therapies that were available earlier uh, by adding a second corrector in addition to the potentiator. Uh, this widely available HEMT became commercially available uh, on October 21st, 2019, which we used to frame our date range for the study. It was also important for us to identify potential institutional impact of these new medications. So with widely available HEMT uh, being available to patients, there's a potential to impact many aspects of care, as we've discussed a little bit. Uh, the goal of this study specifically was to assess the impact of this triple modulator therapy for patients with CF at the New Hampshire Cystic Fibrosis Center uh, at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. The hospitalization data we used from Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center was used to determine just one aspect of the possible institutional impact of this widely available HEMT. And it's also important to note that based on the 2021 CFF registry data, 93.8% of our eligible patients were on widely available HEMT, so a very large percent of the population. A little bit more about the institution where the study was conducted. So Dartmouth Health is New Hampshire's only academic health system 
and it's home to the New Hampshire Cystic Fibrosis Center. The center currently serves 216 pediatric and adult CF patients uh, through two different outpatient clinic locations, one in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and one in Manchester, New Hampshire. So currently there are 119 adult patients and 97 pediatric patients being seen. And the medical center where the admission data was taken from, uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, or DHMC, is located in Lebanon, New Hampshire, where one of the clinics also takes place, and it has 396 inpatient beds. So I, I frame this this way because uh, the majority of the data we have, the hospitalization data, it includes the majority of cystic fibrosis data within the state of New Hampshire. Hopping into the objectives of the study, primarily we wanted to assess the impact of widely available HEMT for patients with cystic fibrosis at an academic medical center. We looked at total number of admissions and the total number of days admitted to the hospital as our primary objectives. For secondary objectives of the study, we wanted to dive in a little bit more to admission reason. So we wanted to assess the impact of this triple modulator therapy on different admission types um, for patients with cystic fibrosis at an academic medical center. We wanted to look at the number of pulmonary related admissions as well as the number of days patients were admitted for pulmonary related admissions. We also looked at the number of GI related admissions and GI related admission days. And if it didn't fall into the category of pulmonary or GI related, we classified those as other admissions and the number of other admission days. And lastly, for the secondary objectives, we wanted to assess the impact on the number of unique patients admitted to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, as well as their median length of stay in days. In order to achieve this, uh, our study design was an IRB approved retrospective chart review that analyzed previous hospital admissions from the electronic medical record within the Dartmouth Health System. This data was electronically extracted from EPIC by the DH Analytics Institute and their reporting systems. And specifically, the time frames that we analyzed data for um, was from October 31st, 2017 to October 31st, 2019, and then from November 1st, 2019 through November 1st, 2021. Uh, the reason we chose these two date ranges, it's including the approximately two years before and two years after the release of widely available AGMT. And this analyzed just data at this single center of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. So the cohort selection, uh, we selected from all pediatric and adult CF patients uh, admitted to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. As I described on the last slide, we chose the two years before and the two years after the release date of uh, widely available HEMT. When collecting the data, we collected specifically the number of hospitalizations within the two timeframes, the length of each hospital stay, as well as uh, reviewed the primary admission diagnosis and classified it as pulmonary related, GI related, or other if it didn't fit into those two categories. For the study methods of analyzing our data, this data analysis was completed by uh, two pharmacists. Uh, we categorized the admission reason based on the primary admission diagnosis listed in the hospital record. Uh, we determined the number of unique patients admitted by uh, counting out the duplicates and making sure we could figure out um, the number of times each individual patient was admitted, calculated the median length of stay, and assessed the difference between the pre-HEMT and post-HEMT cohorts through a variety of statistics, including descriptive statistics, the Wilcoxon signed rank test, and the McNamara test. So now getting into the results. So for the total time period, the four years reviewed, there was a grand total of 348 cystic fibrosis patient admissions to DHMC. Um, of the 348 admissions, 247 of those admissions were in the two years prior to the commercial availability of HEMT, and 101 were in the two years following the availability of HEMT. So there's already a recognizable change in uh, the pre and post HEMT cohorts based on the pie graph there. Diving into more the primary and secondary objectives, the primary objectives being outlined in the bold box at the top of the table, uh, we saw a decrease from the pre-HEMT cohort on the far left to the post-HEMT cohort. We saw in the total number of admissions, there was an absolute reduction of 146 admissions, or a 59% reduction. And in the total number of hospital days between the pre- and post-HEMT cohort, there was a reduction of 1,425 hospital days 
which is a 69% reduction. The secondary objectives seen below, starting with the pulmonary admissions, the number of pulmonary admissions, there is a decrease in 134, or 67% reduction, which was found to be statistically significant, as well as uh, the pulmonary admission days, there is a reduction of 1,330 admission days, or a 71% reduction, which was also found to be statistically significant. Looking at the GI admission days and the number of other admissions, uh, while each category experienced a decrease in the number of admission days and the number of admissions um, of varying uh, degree, uh, they were not found to be statistically significant, even though they were a decrease. And the number of unique patients admitted between the pre-HEMT and post-HEMT cohort, there was a reduction, an absolute reduction of 41 patients uh, a 39% reduction, which was also found to be statistically significant of a reduction. Looking at the median length of stay in days as well, in the pre-HEMT cohort, the median length of stay was seven days. However, in the post-HEMT cohort, that reduced by one day to a, a stay length of six days. The median length of stay, it was a significant, a statistically significant decrease uh, per the Wilcox and Sign rank test. And the proportion of all patients included in the CF registry, so looking at all of the patients um, in the CF registry for they are seen at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, um, that uh, proportion of hospitalized patients was also significantly decreased. So with these results, it's important to keep in mind uh, potential limitations. Uh, as was mentioned in previous uh, talks up here, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic did throw a wrench in the plans. Uh, the pandemic started less than six months after the initial availability of widely available HEMT, and the pandemic certainly impacted the rate of hospital admissions of any cause. Other limitations include um, not all patients in the post-HEMT cohort are on or prescribed HEMT, and this could be for various reasons, uh, including eligibility, different comorbidities, or uh, the inability to tolerate the medication. Also, uh, some patients had access to HEMT prior to November 1st, 2019, due to the release date being in uh, on October 21st, and also due to open label clinical trials. Although uh, in the open label clinical trials, uh, patients at the New Hampshire Cystic Fibrosis Center, only 10 in that pre-HEMT cohort uh, were on HEMT prior to that date. Uh, the primary ignition diagnosis uh, doesn't always represent the patient's hospital course, which is an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, that primary admission reason may not fully describe uh, how, why the patient was hospitalized for the length of time they were, or um, it may not fully give the, the entire picture of why the patient's hospitalized. And lastly, it's also uh, in the post-HEMT cohort. Uh, initially, when uh, widely available HEMT was released, it was released for patients 12 years and older. However, that has uh, changed throughout the time of this uh, data. So more patients could be included in this data um, later on. So keeping the limitations in mind and going back to the results, uh, what we were able to conclude from this study, uh, the results suggest that within the DH health system, when comparing the two years before availability of widely available HEMT, there was a clinically, due to the two years after, there was a clinically relevant decrease in the total number of hospital days and in the total number of admissions for our primary objective. When looking at the secondary objectives, we compared the two years before and after availability of HEMT, and we found a statistically significant decrease in the number of pulmonary-related admissions, the number of pulmonary-related admission days, and the number of unique patients admitted. And lastly, there was a statistically significant decrease in the median length of stay, even though it was only one day less. And as we wrap up here, uh, future directions we could take after having completed this part of the study. As longer-term data becomes available, we could expand the scope. We looked at the two years before and after, and as we've, we've officially reached the point where we could look at three years before and after uh, based on the release date. Um, additional review of the data could be performed to rule out certain limitations by taking a deeper dive into the hospital course of these patients and figuring out, making sure that we have the exact reason that they're admitted and kept at the hospital. And uh, this was just a single center trial. So data from other centers could be studied in the same way to see if these outcomes uh, hold true for other health systems. So I'd like to thank everyone. And uh, I will be in the poster hall later as well, um, presenting this same information if anyone would like to come then. Thank you.
questions. Um, I lost. Okay. Um, did you differentiate pulmonary, pulmonary admissions based on viral, flu, COVID, et cetera, versus bacterial? So we did look at um, different, uh, we did categorize the pulmonary admissions. They were seen as different. They were extracted differently um, in the uh, electronic medical record, but we just looked at overall general pulmonary admissions for the purpose of this. Um, given the co confound of the pan pandemic, did you replicate these analysis in those not on a highly effective modulator therapy? Um, so both these uh, groups included, so the, the cohorts included everyone that was admitted, whether they were on uh, HEMT or not, even in the post cohort. 93.8% um, of eligible patients are on HEMT in that post cohort, but that's not all the patients that are seen in that cohort. We didn't tease it out individually, but those patients are still included. Some questions here. Um, <laughs> did your study make a correlation um, between post-HEMT -hospital, post hospitalizations being related to patients missing HEMT, i.e. insurance delays, forgot to reorder, et cetera? No, we didn't get a chance to, to look into that specifically, but that actually would be really interesting to see if we could pull that out and uh, find more information, because that could definitely be a reason that someone would be hospitalized. Um, if you were to repeat, repeat this study, would you consider analyzing admissions for only patients on HEMT compared to their pre hemt Empty admissions. I think uh, repeating the study. I think this definitely uh, has its its own, um, you know, its its purposes. But that would be a really cool spinoff, I think, because then you could directly measure, you know, the before and after for the patient and see individual improvement. However, I think this itself does so show general improvement without getting too much into the nitty gritty. And I have a question. Yeah. Um, what were the unique diagnoses you had? The fair amount of people that were diagnosed or admit, admitted not pulmonary, not GI, what, what were the unique? Oh, the other yeah. diagnoses? Mm -hmm. That could be just anything that wouldn't be uh, in regards to that. I'm trying to think back of when we did this to some specifics, but um, you know, some pe patients could be admitted for uh, procedures or um, other things of the sort. If it didn't fall into like pulmonary exacerbation, pulmonary related reasons or GI related, um, then it would be considered other, so. Just a question about home IVs. Did you did you look into that? How often are they done at your center? And do you know if that was different for the home IVs? Yeah. Uh, so that I don't actually um, know the difference in that uh, past the scope of um, this project. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our final presenter is Andrew Purdy. Uh, Andrew Purdy is a PharmD PGY2 um, infectious disease pharmacy resident at Indiana University Health Academic Center, uh, Indianapolis. Uh, he graduated from Purdue University College in uh, 2021 and completed his a year of pharmacy practice um, residency at IU Health Academic Center as well. He's gained experience for people uh, living with cystic fibrosis through clinical uh, rotations in the inpatient infectious disease at IU Health University Hospital, as well as pediatric pulmonary clinic at Riley uh, a Hospital for Children. And he's going to be speaking the impact of Alexacaptor, Tizacaptor, Ivacaptor on days of antibiotic treatment in people living with cystic fibrosis. Hello everyone, my name is Andrew and as was introduced, I will be um, going over my study on the impacts of Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor on overall antibiotic use that we have seen among our patients in um, IU Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. I am the PGY2 infectious disease pharmacy resident. Um, hence why I was interested in antibiotic use among this population. I worked very closely with our adult cystic fibrosis uh, pulmonary pharmacists as well on this project, and we have no disclosures. 
So just to set the groundwork and sort of give a little bit of a baseline as to why I was interested in um, going after this study that I did, I know a lot of you are probably familiar with this information already, but this is just a brief overview of some of the phase three clinical trial findings of Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor. There was a major study in the F508 heterozygous population that found um, an FEV1 increase of 14.3% and then a 63% reduction in exacerbations, as well as a CF QR respiratory domain score increase of 20.2 points. And then another study in the F508 deletion homozygous population that found a FEV1 increase of 10% and a CFQR respiratory domain score of 17.4%. So our questions were, what about some of the gaps um, in literature of things that were not included in these trials? So for one, the effects of ETI on overall antibiotic use, both inpatient and outpatient. Secondly, the subjective impacts of ETI on CFQR scores in domains outside of the respiratory domain, specifically digestive and physical domain. And then third, the effects of ETI on people living with cystic fibrosis with a baseline percent predicted FEV1 outside of the 40 to 90 percent that was included in the phase three clinical trials. Specifically, we were interested in the um, advanced lung disease, which was the um, PPV FEV1 of less than 40 percent. So we did a little bit of a background literature search to see what was already out there. We found one small study at a Columbia University Irving Medical Center that looked at advanced lung disease. It included 22 patients. Um, and this found an FEV1 increase of 5.5% and an annual um, average pulmonary exacerbation decrease of 3.76 to 1.38. And then for other CFQR domains, this study was primarily focused on the SNOT22 scores, but as a secondary endpoint, it did look at all um, 12 of the CFQR domains and found significant improvements in eight out of the 12. However, did not define specific numbers in these, at least in the publication. So that leads to the study that we conducted so methods and study design, this was a retrospective chart review study of all of our IU Health adult cystic fibrosis clinic patients. This was collected from the CF registry, from our health record, and surveys collected through patient care. It was a crossover study that compared patients to themselves before and after starting ETI. So we looked um, at the year for each individual patient. We found the year that the medication was shipped to them and used that as a, as a surrogate for the start date of the medication. Looked at the year back from when, the year back from that and counted up overall antibiotic use and then the year after starting ETI and compared the two. So inclusion criteria, basically all of our cystic fibrosis patients at the IU Health Adult Cystic Fibrosis Clinic list. Um, and then exclusion, we excluded patients not taking ETI. We excluded patients who took ETI for less than 12 months consecutively or we had inadequate data available for collection. We excluded lung transplant recipients. We excluded patients um, who were part of the ETI clinical trial, as was alluded to in the last presentation. We felt as though these, these patients could have gotten exposure prior to the release date, so it would be hard to exactly tell when the perfect start date would be. And then we excluded patients who are being treated for NTM because we felt as though the very long treatment course that this requires could potentially skew results. Mm. So primary secondary endpoints, our primary endpoint was days of overall antibiotic treatment. So this included home IV antibiotics, home oral antibiotics, and um, inpatient antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbation. Secondary endpoints, we looked at each individual component of the primary endpoint as its own individual secondary endpoint. Specifically, though, our key secondary endpoint is we wanted to look at the primary endpoint specifically in the advanced lung disease subgroup. We also looked at days of hospitalization for um, anything that wasn't a pulmonary exacerbation. We looked at total number of all-cause hospitalizations, including pulmonary exacerbations as well as everything else. And then we looked at FEV1 and weight increases. And then CFQR score differences in the respiratory, digestive, and physical domains. Statistics, alpha of 0.05, beta of 0.1, 90% power. We used a sign test for non-parametric data and a paired t-test for parametric data. And we calculated a sample size of 44 patients needed to meet power. So results, 
271 patients were part of our initial inclusion from the adult cystic fibrosis clinic center list. Um, 99 of these were excluded for one of the exclusion criteria that I listed previously. As you can see, you can see the breakdown of each of these. So this left us with 172 patients that we included in our overall analysis. This is a overview of the baseline population and baseline characteristics. So mean age at start was 29.2 years with a standard deviation of 10. Overall, we felt like all of our um, baseline characteristics was pretty well balanced, a good balance between male and female, a pretty good balance between CFTR modulator naive and then those that were changing from a previous modulator to um, ETI. Although of the patients that were changing from a previous modulator, the vast majority of them were Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor. We only had a handful of patients that were changing over from Ivacaftor alone or Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor. And then 70% of our patients met the um, 40 to 90% at baseline FEV1, whereas we had 29 patients in our advanced lung disease subgroup. And then F508 homozygous and F508 heterozygous were almost 50-50 split. So we got a good inclusion from both populations. So this is our first bit of results. So these, um, the results were determined as medians and interquartile ranges. So as you can see, the total antibiotics, um, we had a median decrease of 20 less days of antibiotics per person, which was statistically significant. You can see the interquartile range there as well. And then attached is the breakdown of each of the different secondary endpoints for each of the different components of antibiotics. So we had 14 median less days of oral antibiotics. And then the zeros, I'll, I'll describe these a little bit more later. Um, this is, I think, a consequence of us using median as our measure of central tendency. A lot of our patients, a lot of patients who were relatively healthy required very little antibiotics pre-ETI. So I think the zero sort of skewed the, to the left and didn't necessarily reflect of our overall um, decreases that were seen in this study. So I'll add a little bit more context to this on future slides, but the median uh, doesn't necessarily describe this the best, but it was a statistically significant decrease seen both in inpatient as well as home IV antibiotics and number of hospitalizations. The only thing that was not statistically significant was uh, that was not statistically significantly decreased was the days of exacerbation hospitalization or non-exacerbation hospitalization. So. As described earlier, the median didn't necessarily capture everything we wanted, so I decided to get a sum total of days of antibiotics. So this is for all 172 patients, the total days of antibiotics that they used pre-ETI versus post-ETI. As you can see, this is a dramatic decrease, and it was a overall a 69% reduction in overall antibiotic use among this population, with 65% reduction in oral antibiotics, 75% reduction in home IV antibiotics, and 84% reduction in inpatient antibiotics. For visual learners out there, this sort of visually describes this whole data. So the graph on the left is a histogram of overall antibiotic use pre-ETI, and the graph on the right is post-ETI. As you can see, pre-ETI, there are a good amount of patients that did not require a lot of antibiotics, but then there was sort of a um, step down of patients that required significantly more and more days of antibiotics. And this sort of just represents some of the diversity among um, sickness in RCF patients and requirement for antibiotics there. But post-ETI, you can see the vast majority of patients required little to no antibiotics with only a few patients requiring still large amounts of antibiotics. And then these are the results in the advanced lung disease group. So the advanced lung disease group was a total of um, 29 patients, um, and we included, we found a decrease, a median decrease of 22 days of antibiotics overall, with a decrease of 14 days of oral antibiotics, seven days of inpatient antibiotics, as well as significant decreases in hospitalization and home IV antibiotics. Similarly, the non exacerbation hospitalizations was non significant. And then for overall antibiotic days, 
So we found a 55% decrease in overall antibiotics, specifically among our um, advanced lung disease group, uh, 940 days less. This also held up among the each different component of antibiotics with 36% less oral antibiotics, 81% less home IV antibiotics, and 68% less inpatient antibiotics. Similarly, here's a graph. As you can see, among the advanced lung disease group, there was a, a much less patients that required zero antibiotics pre-ETI, but then a large proportion of our advanced lung disease patients required very little antibiotics after starting ETI. Here are results for our FEV1 weight and CFQR scores. Weight increased three kilograms, FEV1 increased 8%. The respiratory domain score increased 27 points. Digestive domain score increased 11 points and physical domain score increased 16.7 points. All were statistically significant. And then in the advanced lung disease group, we saw very similar differences with an increase of 3.7 kilograms in weight, 6.7% increase in FEV1, 33.3 points in the respiratory domain, 11 points in the digestive domain, and then 20 points in the physical domain. All were statistically significant here as well. Here is another visual representation of changes in our FEV1. Um, from baseline to three months, six months, and then 12 months after starting ETI. The graph on the left is the overall patients, and the graph on the right is our advanced lung disease population. As you can see, this rapidly increased, and the uh, change was sustained. So strengths and limitations. One of the strengths is we found that our study, for the most part, was relatively consistent with what was found in clinical trials. In some of our endpoints that we measured that were also measured in clinical trials, we found increases and changes relatively similar, which I think adds some validity to the study. A broader set of patients were used in this study than in clinical trials, including specific patient populations that were excluded from, cl excluded from clinical trials, such as the advanced lung disease group. And then patients served as their own controls in this study as well. Some limitations, which are very similar to, I think, some of the limitations mentioned by previous speakers. This is a retrospective single center study, so isn't necessarily re re reflective of CF patients across the country and the world. Adherence to treatments were not monitored in this study. And then, as just about everyone has said, the post-ETI study period coincided very closely with the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, which impacted a lot of our ability to measure some uh, endpoints. Particularly, I think FEV1 collection was impacted the most by this. So overall conclusions. Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor is effective in reducing days of antibiotics. It's also similarly effective in reducing days of antibiotics in those in the advanced lung disease group. And then CFQR digestive and physical domain scores improved, indicating additional benefits of ETI not seen in clinical trials. So opportunities for farther study, and I think a lot of these opportunities for farther studies were somewhat hinted at in other um, presentations here and are going to be talked about in other data being released throughout this conference. But these were just things I thought of as potential areas that could be um, add-on points to this study going forward. So looking at the effect on inhaled antibiotics and, uh, and other maintenance antibiotics, looking at the effect of ETI on narrow versus broad spectrum antibiotic usage, and looking at the effects of the reduction in antibiotic exposure on rates of MDR or organisms. And that is all I have. What questions do you have for me? There's a question here, which I think you answered. Were you able to extract CFQR from the chart? Is it routinely collected? I think you showed some of that data, but did you want to add anything else mm -hmm. to that? So our CFQR scores were scores that were mainly um, given to patients sort of through care as they, um, pri prior to starting ETI and after starting ETI, as patients would come for clinic visits, we would have them fill out the CFQR scores. So what we did is we basically tallied these up um, by hand so 
This was um, very much like a, a manual extraction, but um, thankfully this, it was one of the benefits of our clinic relatively um, regularly having patients fill out these CFQR surveys. And I had a question. Uh, I, I got kind of fired up at the end. You were mentioning mm -hmm. opportunities for essentially antibiotic stewardship. So mm -hmm. that was great. Did you get a chance or a sense of antibiotic-related side effects and you know, how those have gone down as well? Yeah, that was not something that we measured in this study, unfortunately. So I don't have a lot to add there, but it definitely would be something that I think would be very interesting to look into. And it's definitely something I wish we would have had the opportunity to look through through this study. Thank you. Yep.